Hi everyone and welcome back to Minds and Machines with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. So, um, apologies that it's taken me so long to get this lecture to you. I was feeling a little under the weather this week, as I announced uh, to my students on CU Learn earlier in the week. Um, I think I'm feeling a little bit of burnout. Um, it's nothing COVID-19 related. Um, I was just feeling very uh, tired to the point where I was um, just not able to give you um, the best lecture that you deserve. So um, today's lecture is going to be a little briefer, but uh, a little briefer than normal, uh, I suppose. But what we're going to do is begin taking a look at Man a Machine by Lemaitre. So um, first what we'll do is talk a little bit about who Lemaitre was as a philosopher um, and as a physician, uh, because he's writing this book not just as a philosopher, but also as a physician or a doctor. Uh, even perhaps more so as a physician than a philosopher. So uh, we'll start by taking a little bit of a look at Lemaitre himself, and then we'll look at some of the interesting, um, the interesting things that he discusses in the first part of Man of Machine. So uh, let's get started. So uh, Julien Offray de la Metri was born in Brittany in 1709. So he's an 18th century thinker. Um, this is a little while after some of the thinkers we've looked at previously, like Hobbes and Descartes. He's considered an important materialist thinker in the European Enlightenment, although he, he is kind of one of those later Enlightenment figures. Uh, initially, he was studying theology. Um, when he began his education, but he grew tired of theology and he preferred to study natural philosophy or science, as it was called back in the day. And eventually, uh, Lemaitre decided upon pursuing a career in medicine. So he went to Leiden in the Netherlands, and that is where he studied medicine. And he worked there for a good portion of his life, which actually was not that long of a life, as we'll see. Now, uh, he published L'Homme Machine, or uh, Man a Machine, or Machine Man, you can translate it either way, in 1747. Now, um, some of these writings, both in Man Machine and in his other works, caused a little bit of controversy, as you may have guessed. You know, he was a controversial figure, just like Descartes was, just like Hobbes was, so on and so forth. So, although he was working in the Netherlands, which was a lot more intellectually liberal than many other places in Europe, his work did uh, cause some controversy there in his local community in South Holland, and he fled the Netherlands and went to live in Prussia, um, upon the invitation of Frederick the Great, who was the sovereign of Prussia. Prussia, by the way, uh, it's a country that no longer exists, but it was a German-speaking uh, country uh, now in what would be modern-day Russia, if I'm not mistaken, um, or, or perhaps Poland. I'm actually not sure about the geography here, uh, but Prussia does not exist anymore. Now, Lemaitre died in 1751 at the tender age of 41. Uh, in fact, Frederick the Great uh, gave his eulogy at his funeral. Um, and if you're curious, you can actually read Frederick the Great's uh, funeral oration. Um, it's contained in the same uh, book on Project Gutenberg as Man and Machine is. So if you're curious to see what Frederick the Great had to say about Lemaitre, you can uh, go and have a look there. But he died after becoming ill um, following this banquet that the French ambassador to Prussia held in Lemaitre's honor. So Lemaitre was a physician and he had helped this ambassador overcome an illness. So um, he gets a banquet thrown in his honor and um, we're not sure what exactly happens, but it appears that Lemaitre developed some kind of gastrointestinal illness following this banquet, and he later passed away. Um, and uh, his writings, he's not as widely read as Descartes, or perhaps as Hobbes, but um, I think they're important for us to read here. They're, they say very much um, 
They say very similar things to what Hobbes does, but in a much less scientific way. In fact, the writings that we're going to be looking at today don't really seem all that scientific at all. They're really meant to be more uh, like um, rhetorical, maybe even polemic. It's a bit of punditry, a little bit of skeptical punditry that um, Lemaitre is applying towards spiritualism and dualism and, and so forth. Um, this is meant to be... Um, I'm, I'm not sure it's meant to be so much educational as it's meant to be provocative. Uh, I guess we could put it that way. But in any case, some things you'll want to know going into reading Man Machine uh, are, firstly, that Lemaitre was a materialist philosopher in the mechanistic tradition. So he's a lot like Hobbes, uh, right? He's a mechanistic philosopher. He's a materialist, so he rejects uh, Rene Descartes' substance dualism. He says there is one substance. He's a materialist, so it's physical substance, you know, materialism or physicalism. Um, also, contrary to Descartes, who said that um, humans possess a soul, but animals are mere machines, beast machines, he called them, um, Lemaitre would argue that animals and humans are both machines, and they both have souls. Uh, both non-human animals and human animals have souls. Um, the lower animals have perhaps less sophisticated souls than humans do, but they have souls nonetheless. And these souls enable uh, thinking, feeling, moving. So in this way, you know, you might notice some parallels as you're reading through this uh, between uh, Lemaitre and Descartes. Of course, Lemaitre is not about... Uh, hylomorphism and all of that stuff, but he does kind of look at the soul as something that um, arises out of the, the function and organization of the body. So he's a lot like Aristotle in, um, in that respect. And this is where his materialism really shines through, right? Um, we can explain everything the body does, everything the soul does by virtue of material interactions, right? And that is, of course, a big thing in materialism. The only things that exist is material stuff, matter, energy, you know, physical stuff, and we can explain everything um, by understanding the law-like interactions between all this matter in motion, right? Another interesting thing about Lemaitre, which you'll probably gather as we read through, is that he was a hedonist. Now, what is a hedonist? Uh, today we think of hedonism as, um, you know, uh, if you're a hedonist, perhaps you, uh, if, if you think of hedonism, I should say, perhaps you think of some kind of, um, you know, pleasure seeker uh, who's always um, drinking the best wines and enjoying the best meals, um, you know, somebody who's really into sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? Someone who's, um, you know, well, hedonistic, right? In the colloquial sense. Uh, in the technical sense, hedonism just means that the, the purpose of life is pleasure. And pleasure doesn't necessarily mean, like, getting drunk and partying all the time. Uh, pleasure just means the absence of pain, um, the ability to enjoy life, like... Um, you know, like Epicurus said, and I'm paraphrasing here, Epicurus was a um, founder of hedonism back in the day in ancient Greece. And he said uh, something like, you know, if you just, um, if you let me sit in the garden, give me some wine and a nice pot of cheese, then I'm going to be happy. That's a good life right there. That's the kind of hedonism we're talking about when we talk about philosophical hedonism. So the purpose of life is pleasure, um, avoiding pain, uh, feeling good, feeling happy, not necessarily being some kind of glutton who's always um, drunk and stoned and in pursuit of sexual gratification or something, um, but just somebody who's living a good life, who feels good, who's free from pain, right? Um, but, you know, uh, Lemaitre, remember, did become ill following this banquet where um, apparently, the story goes, he wanted to demonstrate his intestinal fortitude by consuming a whole bunch of um, pate and really rich food. Um, he developed his illness after this banquet, so I don't know. Did Lemaitre overindulge? Was he too much of a hedonist? I don't know. Maybe we remember that he was a hedonist 
more so because this is the way he died. Um, I'm not sure. But anyway, that's another interesting thing about Lemaitre for you. So, physician, philosopher, philosopher in the materialist mechanistic tradition, and a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a hedonist. So, that's a little bit about the man. Uh, now let's talk about the human being as a machine by beginning to take a look at some passages from Man a Machine. All right, let's get started. So Lemaitre begins Man a Machine by writing, It is not enough for a wise man to study nature and truth. He should dare state truth for the benefit of the few who are willing and able to think. As for the rest, who are voluntarily slaves of prejudice, they can no more attain truth than frogs can fly. So, um, just an interesting, um, an interesting opening salvo here, right, from Lemaitre. This is quite provocative. You know, I'm so smart, I need to talk about the truth, tell other people about it, just for those few who are willing and able to be as smart as I am. <laughs> so yeah, um, this is typical of the style, the, the, the sort of rhetorical style that Lemaitre employs throughout this book, right? Um, he's kind of trying to be less like Hobbes and Descartes and maybe a little bit more like uh, somebody like Voltaire, right? He's trying to be provocative throughout this book. He's trying to get those who are willing and able to think, to think, right? Immediately after this, he writes, I reduce the two systems of philosophy which deal with man's soul. The first and older system is materialism. The second is spiritualism. So what's he mean here? How is he divvying up all of this stuff? Well, remember, materialism is a kind of substance monism. Um, sometimes we call this physicalism as well. Only material things exist, and we can explain um, everything by appeal to material interactions, you know, matter in motion. And of course, this is all governed by laws. And this is something that I probably didn't emphasize enough uh, when I was talking about mechanistic philosophy previously, when I was talking about Hobbes, is it's not so much that, um, you know, it's matter in motion and nature, the human being, all of that is like some kind of giant clockwork machine. Um, it's, it's also... A, a, important to note that we can use our reason to identify the principles by which the machine operates, right? Philosophers in the mechanistic tradition are, are very big on identifying these principles. Um, you know, that's like even Isaac Newton, right? Principia Mathematica, right? That was the title of his great uh, book on natural philosophy, uh, Principles of Mathematics. So there you have it. Just thought I should mention that. Why does he say that materialism is the older of the two? Um, well, I think it's probably because he's aware of the pre-Socratic philosophers. And if you recall uh, from our discussion of the pre-Socratics a few weeks ago when we were talking about uh, uh, the run-up to Socrates and the classical philosophy uh, that was going on in Athens, um, the pre-Socratics were... Um, there were a lot of them who were materialist thinkers, right? Uh, Thales, the first pre-Socratic, thought that the arche, the fundamental substance, was water, right? Um, of course, substance pluralists, too. You got, um, uh, you've got thinkers that think that uh, there are four fundamental elements, right? Earth, air, water, and fire, and that everything is made of those. Um, that's also a kind of materialism. And all of these theories turned out to be wrong, um, but... But the important thing for our purposes is that they emphasize that reality can be explained by understanding the stuff, the substance that it's made out of, right? So um, that's why he says it's older. Spiritualism, on the other hand, well, Lemaitre is talking here about uh, dualism, which, as we've already learned, goes at least back to Plato and was probably foreshadowed uh, by Pythagoras. Uh, because Plato was educated in the Pythagorean tradition, and he drew a lot of his inspiration for the theory of forms from geometry, right? Right, you can draw uh, a triangle in the sand. You can draw a triangle on your tablet, right? You can draw a triangle in the air. Um, but none of these will be perfect triangles. But we understand what a perfect triangle is. It's three perfectly straight lines joined at these um, apices, 
um, and the angles of them, the internal angles, sum up to 180 degrees. So we have this perfect idea of a triangle. It must exist somewhere. There must be a, a perfect idea or form of a triangle, right? Uh, that's, that comes from his education, Plato's education as a Pythagorean. So, um, yeah, spiritualism is also pretty old, uh, but this is why Lemaitre says materialism is older, because the pre-Socratics were materialists, by and large. Um, this is not to say, by the way, that Lemaitre outright rejects the existence of God. He doesn't do that. He doesn't out and out say, hey, I'm an atheist. Although it was starting to be a little safer to announce your atheism in Europe around this time. Uh, you probably wouldn't get burned as a witch or anything, but uh, you might have to pack up and move to Prussia, I suppose. Uh, one thing that Lemaitre does do um, is say that, look, if you're talking about revelation or scripture versus nature, you got to go with nature. Because who made nature? Well, uh, God, he argues. So if we've got the Bible and it disagrees with what nature tells us, we got to go with nature. That's what Lemaitre says um, at many points throughout the beginning of this book. But I'm not going to talk about that too much today. I just want you all to be aware of that. Um, so, um, he also doesn't think we need a separate, uh, distinct thinking substance like soul or res cogitans to explain thinking, to explain morality, to explain anything like that. We don't need that. It's, we can give a mechanistic account of all of this. He doesn't exactly do that in this book, is the thing, though. Lemaitre does not actually give us a scientific account of how the human being works. He just kind of rails on about, you know, look at all these good reasons we have for thinking of the human being as a machine. He's not doing the same kind of thing that Hobbes was doing in the first book of Leviathan, for example. Anyway, um... Let's, uh, let's turn and see what he has to say about some of his philosophical forebears. All right, so I forgot to give the page number here, but uh, shortly after the passages we've just looked at, Lemaitre says, The metaphysicians who have hinted that matter may well be endowed with the faculty of thought have perhaps not reasoned ill. For there is in this case a certain advantage in their inadequate way of expressing their meaning. In truth, to ask whether matter can think without considering it otherwise than in itself is like asking whether matter can tell time. It may be foreseen that we shall avoid this reef upon which Locke had the bad luck to make shipwreck. We haven't talked a lot about John Locke here, so I'm not going to go into very much detail here. But, you know, um, what Lemaitre is trying to do here is avoid this trap of thinking that matter itself is endowed with the ability to think. Rather, it, it, the important thing for him is how the matter is organized, right? Think, think again back to Aristotle, or think uh, ahead, if you like, to functionalism. That's the kind of thing he's talking about here. He's not talking about, um, you know, some kind of panpsychism or something, right? Anyway, he continues. The Leibnizians, with their monads, have set up an, an unintelligible hypothesis. They have rather spiritualized matter than materialized the soul. How can we define a being whose nature is absolutely unknown to us? So he's talking about monads, Leibniz and the monads. And I talked a little bit about this. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here. But remember, monads are, I guess, the closest modern... The, modern, the closest modern analogy would be something like virtual particles in quantum physics. And everything operates by this pre-established harmony, and God is like the monad of all monads who ensures this pre-established harmony. Um, so there's no mind-body interaction problem because nothing is actually interacting. Uh, Lemaitre has no time for this. You know, He says, this is just unintelligible. This doesn't make any sense. Nothing is interacting. Uh, these monads are, are, are supposed to be matter, but they're, they're not. What? Uh, that's all, all quite unintelligible, according to Lemaitre. So he has no use for this. And he continues to talk about Descartes. Descartes and all the Cartesians, among whom the followers of Malebranche have long been numbered. Uh, Malebranche, by the way, is somebody who tried to unite um, Descartes' philosophy with 
uh, scholastic philosophy. So just in case you were curious. Um, they have made the same mistake. They have taken for granted two distinct substances in man as if they had seen them and positively counted them. So, uh, you know, he's saying to Descartes and the Cartesians here, look, you say there are two substances, but, you know, you, you, haven't, you haven't actually shown us this. You've reasoned about it, right? Descartes got some clear and distinct ideas, but great, who cares? As we'll see, Lemaitre is a bit of an empiricist. Um, he says, you know, what we've actually got to do is go and look at nature, see how it works. When we look at nature, we don't see thinking substance. We just see material substance. So he's got no time for Descartes and his substance dualism. So Lemaitre says of theology, if there is a revelation, it cannot then contradict nature. As I mentioned before, I said this is on page 86. So if there is a revelation, right, revelation is what is revealed by prophecy and whatnot and what is what is written down in the Bible and so forth. Um, uh, I use the Bible because that's the work um, that Lemaitre would have been talking about. We could talk about any holy book, really, but if there is revelation, it cannot contradict nature. Uh, because, yes, Lemaitre is saying, I'll grant you that God inspired the scripture, but God also made this machinery of nature. So, um, th whatever is in the Revelation that contradicts nature just can't be true. Because God made the world, so we need to look at the world. And, and that's how we're really going to understand what the world is like, what the human being is like. Right? So... On pages 88 and 89, he continues, Experience and observation should therefore be our only guides here. Both are to be found throughout the records of the physicians who were philosophers, and not in the works of the philosophers who were not physicians. So, very empirical, very, very much an empiricist here. And he's saying, as a physician and a philosopher, look, we physicians who are philosophers, we go out and we look at nature and we... We observe it, and that's how we get things done. Philosophers who are not physicians, who just think about things, they don't have the tools to get this job done, to understand how nature really works. To continue, the former physicians who were also philosophers have traveled through and illuminated the labyrinth of man. They alone have laid uh, bare to us those springs of life hidden under the external integument which conceals so many wonders from our eyes. They alone, tranquilly contemplating our soul, have surprised it a thousand times, both in its wretchedness and in its glory, and they have uh, no more uh, despised it in the first estate than they have admired it in the second. So, these physicians who are also philosophers, natural philosophers, right? Keep that in mind. He's talking about doctors and scientists, not rationalist philosophers like Descartes. They alone have explored the labyrinth of man, and they're the ones who, using their experience and observation who are actually qualified to talk about the soul. Not theologians, not Cartesian philosophers, not those uh, crazy Leibnizians, Natural scientists and physicians, those who study nature, are the ones who are going to tell us about the soul. So, very empiricist, also pretty Aristotelian, if you think back to what Aristotle argued in De Anima, and, and if you think back to all of Descartes, uh, or sorry, if you think back to all of Aristotle's, um, you know, vivisections that he performed and whatnot, on all those poor lagoon creatures. Anyway, to continue... What could the others, especially the theologians, have to say? Is it not ridiculous to hear them shamelessly coming to conclusions about a subject concerning which they have had no means of knowing anything, and from which the contrary, and from which on the contrary, excuse me, they have been completely turned aside by obscure studies that have led them to a thousand prejudiced opinions, in a word, to fanaticism, which adds yet more to their ignorance of the mechanism of the body? Yeah, what on earth could these dumb theologians have to say about the body? I mean, they just, they just think about things and read scripture. They don't go and observe nature. <laughs> theologians. 
I mean, again, not really all that scientific, very argumentative, very provocative. Uh, it's no wonder that he upset people by writing this stuff. Anyway, uh, so that, that's, that's some interesting stuff you can take a look at on 88 and 89. Um, he continues, and here's where we really get the, you know, the spirit of what he's talking about here in this entire work. He writes, Man is so complicated a machine that it is impossible to get a clear idea of the machine beforehand, and hence impossible to define it. For this reason, all the investigations have been vain which the greatest philosophers have made a priori, that is to say, insofar as they use, as it were, the wings of the spirit. Okay, so we are so complicated that trying to reason about our nature deductively, a priori, is just not a good idea. Uh, we need to observe. We need to go out and observe the machinery of nature. He continues... Thus it is only a posteriori, or by trying to disentangle the soul from the organs of the body, so to speak, that one can reach the highest probability concerning man's own nature, even though one cannot discover with certainty what his nature is. Now remember, a priori knowledge is certain knowledge. Um, philosophers agree on that. If you can know something a priori, you have some certain knowledge there, right? Um, knowing that... Um, the internal angles of a triangle will sum to 180 degrees is, is a priori. Knowing that a bachelor is single is a priori, right? It's definitionally true. But we can't do this with the human being. We can't reason about the human being a priori, just deductively, just by thinking about it. Um, because we're so complicated. We can get closer to the truth by doing a posteriori, or observational, or inductive reasoning. But we're never going to get all the way there. We're not going to have absolute certainty, but we're going to get closer to the truth than we will by reasoning a priori about the human being. That's what Lemaitre is saying here. So we need to look, once again, at the machine that God or nature, whichever you like, has built. And by doing that, that is how we will understand the soul and that is how we will understand what the human being is. This is an advocation, of course, not just of materialism, but also of empiricism, right? Um, Lemaitre, not a rationalist. Knowledge does not come from primarily the reason or the intellect. Knowledge comes from sense experience. We need to go out, experience the world, observe the world, a posteriori knowledge of the world is what it is possible for us to have. So that is what Lemaitre is arguing throughout this book, in a nutshell. So if we um, follow Lemaitre's advice here and we uh, take a look at nature, uh, if we experience and observe it and apply our reason to nature, um, what can it tell us about the nature of the body? Well, um, Lemaitre lists a few different things. Uh, he lists, for example, the fact that it's been known since ancient times that medicines can alter the minds or the body. This is going back to the ancient Greek physicians like Galen and Hippocrates, right? With their pharmacon that they would, uh, you know, pharmacon means medicine, but it can also mean drug. Uh, it could mean uh, elixir, a potion, um, you know, anything like that. That's a pharmacon. And of course, the ancient Greek physicians knew uh, that these could have effects on the mind and body. Hell, think back to um, Socrates uh, in the Phaedo, drinking the hemlock. The mixture of hemlock was a pharmacon, and Socrates, you know, has to get his friend to make a sacrifice to Asclepius, the god of medicine and healing, right? So these are all material interactions, is Lemaitre's point. Uh, between some something in the medicine and something in the body, um, which causes some kind of interaction, which produces a change in the mind and body. And of course, this is, we all know, this is how medicine works nowadays, right? If you have an infection, have some antibiotics. It's going to keep those bacteria from reproducing. It's going to let your immune system fight the infection, right? If you have a headache, 
Maybe you take some Tylenol, right? It's got some acetaminophen in there, uh, works on your nerves and dulls the pain. And there's a mechanism that explains it, right? So the ancient Greeks knew this, not in as much detail as we do now, uh, but we know it now and we have a much better, much more developed understanding of these kinds of mechanistic interactions. Uh, sleep is something else that Lemaitre talks about, right? When we're asleep, uh, the soul uh, quiets down. Uh, we lose consciousness. But when we're awake, um, we're alert, we're aware, we're conscious, right? So when there's a change in the body, there's a change in the mind and vice versa. Uh, when we're awake, uh, certain maladies, certain illnesses of the mind and body can in turn affect our sleep, right? So, of course, going back to the idea of the pharmacon or medicine, drugs uh, are something that obviously act on the body. And I'm talking drugs, like drug drugs, not like medical drugs. Um, uh, caffeine and opium are two that uh, Lemaitre talks about. Actually, I think he also talks about alcohol as well. But these drugs were widely consumed um, in the day. Um, it's Europe, so alcohol is very big. Um, alcohol is huge in, has been huge in Europe for a long time because um, in the Middle Ages, it was actually hard to get clean drinking water. Um, so people would drink uh, ale wine, uh, stuff like that, more than water, because it had alcohol in it, which would sterilize it, right? So, uh, big drinking culture in Europe. Opium made its way to Europe and obviously proved to be very popular, as did caffeine. And these all have very specific effects on the body, right? Uh, opium makes people sleepy and generates a sense of euphoria. Caffeine does the opposite. It uh, makes you more aware and alert. Uh, wine makes you feel kind of, you know, um, wine drunk, right? So these are all material interactions between these um, drugs and between the body, right? Food, obviously. Food is another one uh, that Lemaitre talks about a lot. And, you know, you kind of get the sense of, you know, here's his hedonism coming through here, right? Like, what are some examples of... Um, uh, Material interactions in the body, obviously wine, drugs, and food, right? So uh, he says on page 93, the human body is a machine which winds its own springs. It is the living image of perpetual movement. So <laughs> that's interesting here. I didn't, I didn't notice this before, but uh, he's kind of likening the body to this naturally built or God-made uh, perpetual motion machine almost. Um, Anyway, he's, he continues, Nourishment keeps up the movements which fever excites. Without food, the soul pines away, goes mad, and dies exhausted. The soul is a taper whose light flares up the moment before it goes out. But nourish the body, pour into its veins life-giving juices and strong liquors, and then the soul grows strong like them, as if arming itself with proud courage. And the soldier whom water would have made flee, grows bold and runs joyously to death uh, to the sound of drums. Thus a hot drink sets into stormy movement the blood which a cold drink would have calmed. Um, this is obviously not how we explain the, these material interactions today. You know, here, uh, Lemaitre is still kind of thinking about uh, changes in the body mostly to do with temperature, or the way the wheels and gears are turning, you know, if you're if you're angry, that's because your blood is hot, uh, you know, or something like that. If you're a coward or if you're lazy, it's because your blood is cold. Give this man some coffee or some brandy and get that blood warmed up, right? This is not how we explain things today. This is not how this stuff really works mechanistically. But... It is a good, I guess, kind of attempt at giving a mechanistic account of what happens in the body. And Hobbes says similar things to this. Descartes said similar things to this. Uh, what have you. So, can't resist reading this um, part about food. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Lemaitre writes on page 99, Raw meat makes animals fierce, and it would have the same effect on man. This is so true that the English, who eat meat red and bloody, and not as well done as ours, seem to share more or less 
in the savagery due to this kind of food and to other causes which can be rendered ineffective by education only. <laughs> um, so, Lemaitre, a bit of a racist toward the English, apparently. No wonder he upset so many people. <laughs> He's saying, oh, those English eating their rare meat. Uh, that's why they're so savage and uncouth. Not like, uh, not like we sophisticated French. Um, <laughs> so yeah, ah, oh god, I don't know, I'm sorry. This savagery creates in the soul pride, hatred, scorn of other nations, indocility, and other sentiments which degrade the character just as heavy food makes a dull and heavy mind whose usual traits are laziness and indolence. Um, again, not how we'd explain things today. Um, we wouldn't say, oh, the reason these people are this way um, is because of the food they eat. I mean, this is, this kind of typifies, I mean, and I, I probably shouldn't have been laughing before. I was laughing because this is just so absurd. Um, but it really, it, it, it's kind of an example, almost an example of a kind of scientific racism, which was actually, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, even up until the beginning of the 20th century is quite problematic and led to, you know, things like eugenics and ultimately to uh, the Holocaust uh, during the Second World War. So um, we don't do this anymore, okay? We don't say, you know, all oh, those English, they're so savage because they eat so much rare meat, you know? We, we don't talk about groups of people this way anymore. Um, I think in, in, in the modern day, this is a, you know, this is, this is a, maybe, a, maybe somewhat of a harmless example to give, but, um, this can get dangerous. This kind of thing can get dangerous. So, uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to this. Um, and if I'm chuckling a lot, well, my, my look, my ancestry is English. So, um, you know, d don't worry. I'm not, I'm not an English racist or anything. Okay. Um, I just wanted to bring this to your attention, that this is a little bit problematic. Of course, age can also affect the mind and the body. Um, one needs only to see the, ne the necessary influence of old age on reason. The soul follows the progress of the body, as it does the progress of education. He writes that on page 95. Um, when someone gets old, their body begins to deteriorate. The mind also begins to deteriorate. Something like uh, dementia or strokes can happen in old age, which will impact cognitive function. So um, even, even someone who's perfectly healthy, um, when we age, our reaction time slows down. Uh, stuff like this just happens naturally as we age. And as we're growing up, if we're lucky enough to have access to an education, we can strengthen the intellect. That's what we're doing here by taking a class on philosophy in university, right? Another problematic thing I, I want to draw your attention to, not just this, um, you know, uh, the crazy raw meat eating English uh, problem, uh, but also um, the, the, the patriarchy and the, the sexism that comes through in some of these, some of, some of what Lemaitre writes. He says, for example, also on page 95, in the weaker sex, he's talking about women, in the weaker sex, the soul accords also with delicacy of temperament, and from this delicacy follows tenderness, affection, quick feelings do more to passion than to reason, prejudices and superstitions whose strong impress can hardly be effaced. Man, on the other hand, whose brain and nerves partake of the firmness of all solids, has not only the stronger features, but also a more vigorous mind. Education, which women lack, strengthens his mind still more. So here's Lemaitre saying, uh, you know, man is a machine, blah, blah, blah. He's not even thinking about women until he gets to this part at where he says, Oh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're more delicate. They're, you know, all about their feelings. They're just pretty things, um, you know, but men are big and strong and we have big, strong man brains and education is good for men. This is why we don't educate women. <laughs> you know, so really quite misogynistic and typical of the time period. Um, this is one of the reasons that I try to encourage you to use inclusive language in your essay assignments and in your writing, right? Um, 
uh, when people, uh, predominantly men, wrote about humankind and used, you know, the gender-exclusive man, um, they really were talking about men. <laughs> they weren't really talking about women or children. Uh, they certainly weren't talking about LGBTQ individuals or perhaps people with disabilities. Like, no, they were talking about men. Um, adult, usually wealthy, educated men. We're not talking about that. We're talking about everyone. We want to understand the human being, not man. So try and use inclusive language in your writing in this class. This is the reason why. We're trying to avoid this historical misogyny and, and this, this kind of patriarchal way of looking at humanity. We are trying to get away from this. We've been there, done that, not a good look for the human race, so don't do it, okay? Okay. So to try and sum up what I've talked about so far, um, or rather, this is how Lemaitre kind of sums up what I've been talking about, or what he's been talking about. He writes, Thus, the diverse states of the soul are always correlative with those of the body. But the better to show this dependence in its completeness and its causes, let us make here use of comparative anatomy. Let us lay bare the organs of man and animals. How can human nature be known if we may not derive any light from an exact comparison of the structure of man and of animals? So he says, like, look, there's all these good reasons to think that they, you know, quote, diverse states of the soul correlate with the states of the body right? The soul is something that arises out of the body. This is kind of Aristotelian, kind of functionalist. It's also maybe a bit like the liar analogy from the Phaedo, right? If the body is a liar, the soul is the harmony of the liar. Uh, it's a lot like that. But where do we go from here? We want to know more than just that. So he says, let's talk about um, humans compared with non-human animals. And this is kind of another direct dig at Descartes. Because remember, I've said this many times, Descartes believed that animals were soulless automatons. They were uh, bit machine, beast machines, right? They had no souls. The human body is a machine, but humans have souls. And that soul, that thinking thing, or res cogitans, the ego in the cogito ergo sum, is you. Um, so that's what Descartes says. Lemaitre says, no, there's no res cogitans. There's only matter in motion. Um, so if animals are machines, then so is the human being. And we agree that the human being has a soul, so animals have souls too. They may be less sophisticated than ours, but they have them nonetheless. So Lemaitre, and one of the things I think he, he, I'd like to give him credit for here, is arguing that humans and animals both are machines with souls. And there is not this vast difference between humans and animals uh, that theologians would, would teach, right? It's not like there's some great chain of being with God at the top and humans in the middle and animals below us. No, it's really a matter, the difference between humans and non-human animals is really a matter of degree and not really a matter of uh, kind, if you like, um, at least in terms of their thinking abilities or their possession of a, of a soul, right? So that is where Lemaitre wants to go next. And I want to take the last uh, couple of slides that I've prepared uh, to go over some of these interesting points of comparison between humans and animals. So, that's what we'll do uh, before we wrap up. So, as a physician and a philosopher, what Lemaitre does next is point to the anatomical similarities between humans and other kinds of mammals. He says on page 98, for example, in general, the form and the structure of the brains of quadrupeds are almost the same as those of the brain of man. The same shape, the same arrangement everywhere, with this essential difference, that of all the animals, man is the one whose brain is largest and, in proportion to its mass, more convoluted than the brain of any other man mammal, or animal. Excuse me. <clears throat> then come the monkey, the beaver, the elephant, the dog, the fox, the cat, so on. 
End quote. It's interesting that beaver is right after monkey. Hmm. Anyway, this is interesting not just because Lemaitre is a physician and he's um, observing and experiencing nature here and sharing these observations about the anatomical similarity between humans and other kinds of animals, particularly mammals. I think this is also interesting because it foreshadows, um, uh, to a certain extent, uh, some of what Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace would have to say in the 19th century. This is earlier than this. This is 18th century stuff. And probably around this time, Erasmus Darwin um, would have been writing the same kinds of stuff, maybe a little bit before this. Erasmus Darwin was Charles Darwin's grandfather, um, also a naturalist, just like Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace were. Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, by the way, if you don't know, were the co-discoverers of, uh, co of evolution by natural selection. Uh, the descent of life forms from other life forms, right? Um, and they noticed these anatomical similarities, and that was one of their... That was one of the observations they used to come up with the theory of evolution by natural selection. So it's just interesting that um, a, a little bit of foreshadowing is going on here. And Darwin would uh, make very similar arguments to Lemaitre later in the 19th century, that man is not special. Man is not created in God's image. Human beings rather evolved from other life forms, from other apes, actually. So uh, from there, Lemaitre goes on to make some interesting points, uh, some interesting observations about uh, animals' abilities to learn. Um, he writes on page 100, among animals, some learn to speak and sing. They remember tunes and strike the notes as exactly as a musician. Others, for instance the ape, show more intelligence and yet cannot learn music. What is the reason for this, except some defect in the organs of speech? Well, Lemaitre is on to something that's actually quite modern here. Um, it had been known uh, for a long time that birds could learn songs, right? Um, in Europe, um, uh, thinkers like Descartes uh, had earlier used examples of uh, ravens and magpies and, and birds like this, members of the corvid family learning to speak. Um, parrots do the same thing, right? Um, and uh, parrots and also corvids uh, can also learn to use tools and solve problems, which is something that was not known at this time, but which we do know now. I'll share a video of um, some smart birds. You know, maybe we'll get Alex the African Grey Parrot. I'll share a video down below so you can see how smart these birds are, right? They don't just learn to mimic um, speech. Uh, they can actually learn to problem solve and even learn tool, uh, learn tool use. Um, so apes, of course, are highly intelligent. They're very intelligent probably thanks to their limbs and their opposable thumbs and their big brains, right? Apes can use tools. Uh, apes can solve very complicated problems. But one thing that apes cannot do is speak, right? Apes um, have a very limited range of sounds that they can produce. They can howl, uh, growl, they can uh, pant hoot. Um, you know, the pant hoot is that, <laughs> you know, that's an ape sound. Um, but they have a limited, uh, they have a limited range of sounds because of the way their larynx is. Um, basically evolution has not given them a larynx, a larynx like ours. They don't have a voice box suited to talking, to doing what I'm doing now. You know, I'm just pushing a little bit of air through those vocal cords and th they're vibrating and, and they're set up in such a way that that can happen. This is not the case with apes, Right. So maybe an ape could learn to speak, uh, Lemaitre is saying, if it had the right kind of bodily machinery. If it had a larynx like ours, it could learn to speak. Or we could teach them sign language. And in fact, you, you probably know we have done this in the 21st century. I mean, we've got Coco the gorilla, for example. Uh, we've got... Uh, we've got members of the great apes. We've got, you know, chimpanzees, uh, bonobos, gorillas. I'm not sure if we've done it with orangutans, but the great apes, those are all the great apes, including us. Uh, and they can learn sign language and they can communicate 
uh, with people using simple sign language. It's, a, it's an ape version of American Sign Language, I think, like a simplified ASL, but they can learn it and they can communicate much better with their hands and their bodies than they can with their voices because they cannot vocalize like we can. And researchers in the 20th century uh, did this. And it's interesting to note that as you read uh, a little bit past this in uh, Man and Machine, Lemaitre actually um, thinks that uh, perhaps language originated among humans in this way, that perhaps before we spoke, we made signs and gestures. And that uh, perhaps if there was an ape that was close enough anatomically to us, it could learn to sign and maybe even learn to speak. He mentions the man of the woods in this section, and the man of the woods, uh, well, man of the woods is what orangutan means, right? So orangutans live in uh, uh, South, uh, South Asia, um, and uh, I forget the language. Uh, maybe it might be Sumatran. Uh, I don't. I don't know the language that the word orangutan comes from. But it does mean man of the woods. I'm not sure if Lemaitre is actually saying, "Hey, I bet if I had an orangutan, I could teach it how to communicate with sign language and maybe speak." Uh, I don't know if he's saying that or if he's just talking about some as yet undiscovered ape um, that's anatomically similar enough to humans to be able to speak. Um, it's not clear to me, but it's just interesting uh, that he talks about animal intelligence in this way. This is something that was uh, very much overlooked by Descartes. And he says, you know, look, animals can learn to sing. We could probably teach an ape how to communicate its thoughts with sign language. Uh, so Descartes, you're wrong. Um, animals have souls. They're not soulless automata. They're not beast machines. They have souls like we do. Their bodies and brains are less complicated, so their souls are probably a bit less sophisticated, but they have souls nonetheless. And I think that's something that's really interesting and forward-thinking in this book. It certainly offsets the um, misogyny and scientific racism we encountered earlier. All right, so that is about it for today. Um, as I said, I'm going to post some links uh, down below here. Uh, to show you some examples of animal intelligence. I'll show you some clever birds, uh, perhaps using tools, and I'll find some videos of apes communicating with sign language, um, or perhaps with cards. Uh, that's also been done. Apes can point at cards that represent certain things and communicate that way. Uh, but what we've done today, otherwise, is take a, taken a look uh, at uh, the first part of Man and Machine. Um, kind of kept ourselves limited uh, in terms of what we've looked at, uh, only up until about page 100, 110 or so. Uh, next time we were going to just briefly go over a few more interesting parts, um, especially the parts that concern reason and the imagination, uh, parts that concern morality and natural law, and then we'll come back to the nature of the body, namely um, that it is a machine. Um, so, again, next lecture probably will be a little bit shorter. I apologize, but it will probably go up over the weekend, but uh, just watch it when you have a chance. I'll try to keep it short for all of you. Um, and again, we'll look at selections from this book so that you can just zero in on those sections, read them for yourself, um, and um, perhaps think about some interesting questions to ask in our discussion forums or something interesting to talk about for your essay or for your final reading response. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, I hope you uh, will get in touch with me if you have any questions about the material we've talked about. And I will see you next time where we will wrap up Man a Machine. All right, take care, everyone. Bye for now, and I'll see you next time.